Okay, good evening everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar. My name is Hazel Lawton from the SEC Consulting Office in Lanark. I'll be your chair for this evening and tonight I'm also joined in the background by my colleagues Craig Bothwell and Daniel Stout. Um, they'll be there to make sure all the, the technology works and be there to take your questions um, for later on this evening. So this is the second webinar of the Sustainable Sheep System series. Um, hopefully some of you are, are attending the second one that came back, uh, sorry, joined the first one with us. Um, we have a, a page on the FAS website, which is dedicated to all the, the project outputs. Um, so you can see that, that link there that we can send around to people afterwards um, and you can join the, the page for any updates, publications that we release, et cetera. So tonight um, we're joined by our, our guest speaker, uh, Mary Young, who's a nutritionist with the SAC Livestock Specialist Team. Um, we're going to run for one hour, finishing at approximately half past eight. There'll be time at the end for some questions. We are going to start off with a poll as well. Now, this is just for our benefit, just to see what sort of system people are running this evening, to see what our sort of audience is. So Craig will just launch the, the, the poll for us just now. So what we're wanting to know is if you're a, an upland farmer or a lowland farmer and if you're indoor or outdoor lambing. If you have both, you have a bit of indoor and a bit of outdoor, then you can click both options. And that will just give us an idea of where you're all joining from. OK, so the results are in. So a, a bit of a mix tonight. That's good. Um, we've obviously got people on from all over the country um, and different lambing systems. So that's excellent. Um, that also means we'll have a, a lot of varied questions. So that's good. Um, as I say, feel free to put your your chat, uh, sorry, your questions in the chat throughout the night, and we'll, we'll get to them at the end. If anybody's experiencing any technical difficulties, also put it in the chat, and one of us will get get back to you hopefully and, and sort any problems. So the the reason that we're having this webinar is obviously um, correct management and nutrition of the the cows all year round is absolutely vital, um, and it underpins their capability to to get in lamb to rear those lambs, um, to cope with any worm and parasite burdens that they might face um, and handle all weather conditions. And obviously the, the weather in most areas hasn't been very kind for the start of this year. I don't know about everybody joining, but we've not really seen the grass much since Boxing Day. So that's one thing we're sort of going to look at tonight. Um, obviously the success of the yow to manage all of these challenges and burdens makes her um, absolutely vital as her part of a profitable year in the system. So no doubt there'll hopefully be a lot of questions and we'll get to those at the end. Um, so at the moment, I'm just going to pass over to Mary, who's going to take us through the, the next part of the, the presentation. Great, that's me. <laughs> um, thanks, Hazel. Hopefully my screen will appear. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, okay. here's a lot of that good. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, as Hazel said, my name's Mary Young. I'm part of the livestock team with SAC Consulting. Um, I've been working with SAC now for about five years um, in the beef and sheep side of things, really. Um, so tonight we're focusing on sheep, um, feeding the pregnant ewe. And as Hazel said, it's quite timely right now with, um, well, over the country, it has been quite diverse in how much snow people have got, but um, a lot of people are facing quite extreme conditions at the minute. So um, we've got a bit of a focus on that this evening um, and sort of planning your feeding. Uh, and my outline for this evening was to look at optimizing forage first and assessing your stock's condition. What are the sort of key times in our production cycle for doing that? Uh, the nutritional requirements in mid and late pregnancy and then managing feeding in extreme weather and then a little bit on forage budgeting and a quick example at the end. So first off I thought it would be useful just to give a background in what we're actually trying to achieve when we're feeding the ewe. Um, it's all about feeding the rumen uh, in order to feed the ewe so unlike humans we can't digest grass and forage that is what makes a ewe and a you know a beef cow unique that she is a ruminant animal she can digest these forages um, so it's all about keeping these bugs happy so I've got a picture here on the left hand side of what sort of diagram of the rumen digest the overall digestive system of a sheep looks like uh, so it's the most important digestive organ in the sheep 
It needs a constant and balanced nutrient supply to make the best of the diet that's on offer to her. Um, so you can see in this picture on the left-hand side, there's some energy coming in and degradable protein. So energy in the form of fermentable energy comes from different feed sources. Um, your forage has fermentable energy, your grass, your silage, hay, um, the sort of feed that has purely fermentable energy would be molasses. So if you think of that on one end of the scale, molasses, which is pure fermentable energy. Um, and then your poor quality forages might be lower in uh, fermentable energy. So they need a, a source of this energy in order for the bugs to capture the degradable protein that's coming in. Um, in, into the, the digestive system through their feed. So your degradable protein also comes through your forages, uh, your silages, your grass, really good sources of degradable protein. Uh, urea is 100% degradable protein. So if you think that of that on the, uh, similar to molasses on your extreme end, that is purely degradable protein. So the bugs use this degradable protein from your forage with the energy and they capture that and they make what's called microbial protein. So that's a really important source of protein for your ewe, um, particularly in pregnancy when she's trying to support herself and a growing fetus as well. So most of her protein requirements will come from that microbial protein that's made by the bugs. So that's why it's so important. She's got a source of this energy and degradable protein. Um, you'll see at the the bottom towards the small intestine there, I've got a circle with DUP, so that's the digestible undegradable protein. So that's protein that bypasses the rumen, basically doesn't get digested by these rumen bugs uh, and gets absorbed in the small intestine. So that kind of comes more into play in late pregnancy when her requirements ramp up really high. Um, she's got uh, a lot going on in late pregnancy that sort of last three weeks. Um, She'll talk a bit a little, a little bit about later in her requirements, but that's where the bypass protein plays an important role to help um, meet those requirements as they get higher. So she needs a supply of fermentable energy, forage, digestible fiber, and if necessary, she might need concentrates as well, just to top up where there might be a gap in energy and protein um, that's not coming from the forage. Uh, so it's really important to remember that that's the base of most of your rations will be your forage. So the objective is to optimize the contrib uh, contribution from forage in the ration. Um, so ideally getting your silage or hay analyzed um, is essential to assess the potential. When I talk about potential, I'm, I'm talking about that energy and protein um, and dry matter as well is really important because um, that will affect how much she'll need to eat or how much um, is needed uh, in her ration. So the energy and protein from your silage or, or hay, depending on what the base of your ration is, is so important uh, that you know that if you're on the lower end of the energy a scale from your silage analysis, then you'll know you might need to top up with a higher energy concentrate. And if you're at the higher energy level um, with really good energy coming from the forage, then you may get away with less concentrates or no concentrates up until, you know, closer to lambing until the requirements start to increase further. So you're aiming to optimize that forage intake as much as possible. Um, there's a lot of things that can affect their forage intake. Um, access is really important. Um, in, in sheep, chop length has a, a big effect on their intakes as well. Um, so if you think of a big bale sitting out in a ring feeder, that's quite a long chop, uh, or hasn't been chopped quite long. She's taken quite a lot of energy to pull that out um, and that's going to affect her intakes because she's having to pull it apart. Um, compared to um, these use in the, the picture that I've shown there, that sort of TMR type feeding, the total mixed rations, if it's mixed in a mixer wagon with her concentrates or um, that shorter chop length, that's going to have a big effect and increasing her forage intakes. There's a lot of um, factors that can affect that. It's important to take them into account when rationing. You want to complement your forage with a minimal amount of supplement. Um, when I say minimal, I don't mean you're trying to get away with nothing. In some cases, you may get away with very little to, to no um, supplements, but um, it's what complements your forage, the base of your ration, the best if you're needing um, 
a little bit or you may need more if it is on the lower energy scale as I was saying. Also using the correct type and quality of supplement. Um, when I say correct type, uh, I mean that it's a specified U roll or pellet. Um, it's not just a general purpose. Um, you can sometimes see in the mineral nutrition side of things, these general purpose minerals. What you want to be looking for is something that's specific to the U and uh, that meets her requirements and also the quality of the supplement as well. Uh, so it's really important in late pregnancy, as I said, her requirements do go up quite uh, considerably. So that's not the time to be feeding low quality, uh, low energy feeds. Um, she needs good quality, you know, high, high energy, 12 and a half ME would be a minimum when you're looking at your concentrate feeds. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that more when we come to the rationing example. Uh, so forage analysis, I think it probably gets banged on a lot about um, from nutritionists, but it is really important that you know um, what the base of your ration is, because this is what's making up most of her energy and protein intake. So put a few pictures there just as examples of different forages that might be fed. Um, for example, grass with a lot of clover in there in that picture, or some silage with a bit of haylage maybe, or bales um, or pit silage. It can all have a, a massive effect in quality and nutritive value. So having that analysed just to know what are you getting from that forage and how can you best complement that. Uh, so I thought I would just show what the results were looking like at SAC and the silages that have come through so far that have been analysed at, at our SAC lab. So these have been taken between May 2020 and sort of the end of January 21. Uh, I've split them up into first and second cuts. So we've got pit silage there and your bales. Um, very similar in terms of energy and protein, both in the, the pit and bales first and second cut. The Biggest difference between the pit and bales is probably the dry matter, which uh, would be, probably be expected really, because the bales would tend to be on the drier side. Uh, but overall, fairly um, good quality dry silage, uh, averaging about 294 to 298 in the pit and 364 to 340 in the bales. The energy overall is fairly stable between first and second cuts. Generally, you would expect your first cuts to be slightly higher in energy but, but there wasn't a, a big difference on average between the first and second cuts uh, both in the pit and the bale. But there was a bit of a difference in the uh, crude protein you can see in the first cuts they averaged about 110 both in pits and bales first cut and then in the um, second cuts the pit and Bales both seem to go up in crude protein on average. Uh, it's only by 10 grams per kilo uh, or 1% or if you're looking at it in a percentage uh, way, but um, still an interesting pattern. I'm not entirely sure what the cause of the increase in crude protein in second cuts was, if it was due to the fact the first cuts were taken during the drier period of summer and perhaps fertilizer hadn't been taken up and it was taken up by the second cut. Um, but that's something to, to be aware of. If you have different stacks uh, of bales that are come from different cuts, or if you have um, second cut at the front of your pit and first cut at the back, how that forage is going to um, change in its nutritive value. It's really important that you balance it uh, correctly. And I put the NDF values as well, which is the fiber content. And that sort of relates to the energy. Um, generally higher NDF levels, the, the lower the energy. So really important to get your own forage tested. There's so many factors that affect the quality. Um, I, obviously, I've just put averages here, but there was a massive range that came into the lab. Um, I put there that 20% of samples analyzed below 100 grams per kilo of crude protein and dry matter. Uh, so it's really important if your forage does fall into that category, if it's in that lower end of crude protein and the dry um, in, in your silage, sorry, that you're going to need to balance that appropriately. So you might need to add a protein supplement um, and, and just add it slightly sooner than, than you would have if your silage was better last year, for example. So it's really important uh, to bear in mind, it's not going to be the same silage year on year. Um, there's so many factors that do affect the quality, um, weather conditions, um, wilting periods, all these kind of things come into play. 
So silage and haylage fairly similar that the different dry matters nutritional qualities will depend on the timing of the making and quality of the grass that's been used. Um, so if you've reseeded recently or if you've got you know clover in the mix that will have a massive effect on your nutritional quality. Hay as well, I think a lot of people have the impression that hay is just hay, but you do get a range of qualities and energy and protein in your hay as well. Um, that can also have a massive um, effect in your rations. Uh, straw, I don't know if many people are using straw this year. It is low in protein and energy, and it really does need a careful supplementation, particularly in a later pregnancy. Due to the scarcity of straw at the minute, I'm not sure if many people will be using that as a source um, for their rations, but um, because it is so low in protein and energy, it definitely needs supplemented uh, with concentrates and also very low in minerals and vitamins as well. So it needs careful consideration if straw is the base of your ration. Uh, so moving on to condition scoring a little bit about uh, body condition scoring regularly assessing so that that's what all these key performance indicators talk about is the regular assessments what are they looking at at these key times i've highlighted scanning and pre-housing slash eight weeks pre-lambing if you're lambing outdoors um because this is kind of where most people will be at just now a lot of people are getting the scanners in uh, or have got the scanners in so there's a really good opportunity just to lay a hand on Feel what their condition score is like. Um, again, <laughs> alongside forage analysis, nutritionists probably bang on about body condition scoring quite a lot as well, but it really is the base of so many of the rationing decisions that you make. Um, I put a picture there, this is a FAST event uh, that we did about two years ago down in the borders and we got a pen of sheep and there were all sort of different conditions and we just got everyone to lay a hand on, see what they felt um, their condition was and what they would score them. So it was five uh, ewes in a pen. And it was really interesting just how people would sort of calibrate their hands differently. So what might feel like a three to me might have felt like a three and a half to someone else because their flock at home might have been on the leaner or heavier side and that's what a three and a half feels to them. So I think we can, we can overcomplicate body condition scoring, but it's really important that it's the same person that's condition scoring them and that you calibrate in your own head what in your mind feels like a three. So a, a three is sort of for a lowland you where you want there to be three and a half, three uh, during sort of production cycle and around uh, pregnancy. So if, if you feel a couple of yous in your flock just to get a feel for what feels like each condition score. A lot of people talk about them get going through the race and you get to sheep number 10 and you're thinking actually she feels more like a three and the previous ones I scored aren't, aren't quite a three anymore. So it's good just to lay your hand on a few before you start um, scoring them. If you're taking more than you know three to four seconds to think about it, you're probably overthinking it. So it's a, it's a quick, um, easy thing to do as they're going through and uh, so we'd really encourage you just to keep assessing them at these times and take record of it and actually act on those results as well particularly around scanning time when you're working out who your singles your twins your triplets are and how you can um manage them separately in their feeding uh, this is another thing I like to show quite a lot. It's the QMS timeline. Uh, it's a really handy thing to have. It just shows the whole production cycle of the U. Um, you can see I've highlighted there the second 50 days. That's kind of the mid-pregnancy period. Um, in, in the timeline, it shows you what's important in all these different periods of her production cycle. Um, so in the second 50 days, that's when the placenta is growing and starts to develop. Um, it used to be that it was sort of advisable that you could lose a bit of condition at this point in pregnancy, but actually there's been more research done just to show that it's probably better to hold condition at this point, uh, if not gain slightly because of the placental development that you don't want to be having a knock-on effect on that placental growth and development. Uh, as if you're underfeeding at this point, you can't really make up for that placental growth later on in pregnancy. Um, so just to show uh, this graph, I thought explained it quite well. Um, so in mid-pregnancy, that's months two and three. You've got 
sort of three major growth phases in the sheep. And that second major growth phase is the placental growth, um, which is happening in mid-pregnancy. So I, I assume most people are in this sort of mid-pregnancy period at the moment. Um, so you've got the placental development that's most susceptible to undernutrition at this time. Uh, you really want to maintain a level plane of nutrition and supplement where necessary. For example, in extreme weather, which uh, is quite apt at the moment. Um, loss of body condition score can impact the ewes performance, the lambs growth and the birth weight. If you think of the placenta, it's the major um, vessel between the ewe and her lamb, and that's how she provides all the nutrients to a lamb. Um, that's the, the link between the two of them. So it's so important that you are um, feeding her well so that that can develop um, and, and grow. A mild degree of underfeeding can be tolerated in particularly fit use. So that's fit use that are above a condition score of three and a half. I would caveat that you don't want to be too hard on them. So if they're losing more than half a condition score, that's too much um, of undernutrition. She's having to mobilize too much of her own body reserve. Um, I'd say do it gradually, um, taken off very gradually and not more than half a condition score, as I said. So ideally you want to scan between sort of 50 to 90 days, which a lot of people probably are at the moment. Um, so early as possible really, so that you can say, separate those groups and feed up those ones that are needing some extra. So for example, if you're finding when your body condition scoring, there's some thin use, you could feed those alongside the triplets that are getting a bit of extra feeding or the singles and fit twins, if they are a bit um, on the fit side, you could put them in with your singles group. So some feeding guidelines for mid-pregnancy in snowy conditions, which I thought was quite apt um, for just now. Um, on the table on the right here, I've got some targets. So target body condition score for a lowland ewe is between sort of three and three and a half. For a hill ewe, it's more like two and a half. Uh, the metabolizable energy requirements. Um, so metabolizable energy is what we talk about in ruminant nutrition quite a lot. Uh, similar to how we think about calories in a, a human's diet, how much, how many calories a woman needs per day, for example. That's exactly what we're looking at in the sheep. So our metabolizable energy requirements for lowland ewe is between sort of 7.2 and 9.6 megajoules per day. So it's, it's not massive. If you think about in late pregnancy, she's needing more like 18 megajoules per day as you get sort of right up near to one week pre-lambing. So it's still fairly low, but she does need um, some sort of forage allowance. So the grass or forage dry matter allowance, uh, so most things are worked out on a dry matter basis and then converted back to fresh weight. So in a dry matter allowance with a forage of quality 10 megajoules. This is sort of a guideline of how much uh, dry matter she's going to need. So between 0.72 and 0.96 kilograms of dry matter for a lowland ewe. So just to put that in terms of fresh weight, um, I base this off a 25% dry matter silage. So fairly average dry matter. Uh, lowland ewe will need around three to four kilos of silage or if you're feeding hay, about 0.85 to a kilo of hay. If they're in good body condition score, at this point in pregnancy, they shouldn't need any extra concentrates, depending on the quality of your forage. Um, but given she only needs about 7.2 to 9.6 megajoules, that should be sufficient uh, from far her forage alone. For hill use in reasonable condition, if the snow or ice is restricting the access to normal grazing, then hay is needed in this um, example. So around 0.6 to 0.7 kilos per head. High energy blocks or buckets can be offered as an additional energy to use. And um, they'll provide about two to three extra megajoules to help top them up. Um, but obviously they do need some sort of forage supply. It's not going to be uh, her, her total requirement from these energy buckets uh, or blocks. It can also be a good training tool as well for when she will need them later in pregnancy. So the recommended um, sorry, recommended sort of rate is one block or bucket per 30 use um, if you are supplementing with a bucket. For thin use, so that's for 
uh, use that are below a body condition score of two. Don't be tempted to feed over generous amounts of feed. That can lead to other problems like acidosis risk or predisposing them to pregnancy, toxemia or twin lamb disease. So ideally you want to start off at a low level of a good quality compound, so about 250 grams per day, and then working that up to about 50 to 100 grams per day until you're up to about 0.45 of a kilo alongside good ad lib forage. Um, so that's for your, your thinner ewes that are just needing a little bit of extra TLC. So moving on to later in pregnancy, so back to my QMS timeline, um, we're in the third 50 days. So ensuring ewes are fit for lambing. What I like about this timeline is the golden days that they highlight as well. So you can see that there's the golden 35 days. So that's when it's essential to to feed to maintain your body condition scores. So there's the growing fetus, the udders increasing and her nutritional demands are increasing as a result of that. Uh, so I think this graph shows it quite nicely. Um, as I was talking about in mid-pregnancy, that, that placental growth, you can see in the graph there, how it's uh, increased between sort of 12 to eight weeks and then plateaus off. Whereas the fetus, the growth hasn't really increase that dramatically. A little sheep there is saying only 25% of final weight with just six weeks to go. So that's a lot um, to, to gain in those last six weeks. So not a time for low quality feeds. So the, the lamb puts 50% of the birth weight down in the last three weeks and also the woolly coat grows in the last week. So lots of demand on her energy and protein. So late pregnancy, high quality feed is essential with high intake to meet her demands. And in addition to all of this, she's also got her other developments, as I mentioned, her colostrum production, and she's trying to maintain her own immunity. Um, so that's where you can see problems with increasing in worm burdens and things like that. So making sure that one of these isn't knocked off because she can't maintain herself. So she's got an increasing requirements with a decrease in appetite. Uh, I think the picture on the right shows that quite nicely. You can see at week 12, the rumen is still taking up the majority of the space in her abdomen. As you get to week 20, that's when the fetus has grown and is sort of pushing in on the rumen uh, and restricting her intake slightly. Um, it's also important to bear in mind that although it's reducing her rumen intake, her throughput is also uh, increased. So she is eating. Um, more as well, uh, even though her, her intake capacity has reduced. Uh, so I thought I would move on to an example of how to formulate a ration. Um, please bear with me. I know this might feel like a bit of a mathematical exercise, but I'll try to break it down step by step and just show you the steps that I use to do a quick ration uh, that you can do yourself on farm. So the first thing you need to do when you're doing any ration is predicting what her dry matter intake will be. So the table I've got here, you can get this from the Feeding the U booklet from AHDB. And it's basically a, a, a table that works out the quality of your forage and predicts the uh, dry matter intake based on that. So for example, if you look at good silage there, that's 10 and a half ME. At 12 to 3 weeks pre lambing she'll eat about 1.6% of her body weight from the forage, uh, so from that good silage. And then it slightly reduces at 3 to 0 weeks or at lambing uh, to 1.4% of her body weight, so you have to factor that in as well whenever you're rationing. Uh, the next thing you need to know is her energy requirements. Uh, so again, you can find these energy tables. They're AFRC. Um, sort of standards for, for use, but you can get them in the AHDB feeding the U booklet as well. So don't really have to memorize these tables, um, but they're set for different weights. I've just taken out a 70 kilo U as an example here, just to not bombard you with lots of figures, but a 70 kilo U for singles and twins. Uh, so for twins at seven weeks, she only needs about 11 megajoules. And you can see by one week pre-lambing, she's needing 18 megajoules. So it ramps up quite a lot by 
one week pre lambing. So to go through the steps now for the diet of a 70 kilogram U carrying twins, now that I've predicted what our dry matter intake will be, and I've looked at our energy requirements. Next thing I need is my silage analysis. So I have good silage, it's 10 and a half ME. Uh, so I know that she'll eat to appetite about 1.6% of her body weight. The next thing I need is a good compound. So I think I mentioned this at the start, but 12 and a half ME is an absolute minimum in late pregnancy. Any lower than that, then you're going to have to feed really large amounts of concentrate that's just not going to be sustainable and can lead to other issues like acidosis. Um, so the compound labels, it's not a legal requirement for the compound um, manufacturer to state what the ME is on the label. Most reputable companies will tell you what the ME is if you just ask them. If they're not telling you, that's maybe a sign um, of why they're not telling you. But also looking at things like the ingredients list. Uh, so this is in descending order. So the highest um, on the list will be first. So looking for things that are high in energy, like cereals, uh, distillers grains, soya, rapeseed meal, good protein sources as well, high up on the list. Um, other things to look at are the fiber content. So the fiber is above 10% on the label. Again, that is another indication. There's a lot of um, low energy filler feeds in that compound. So just some things to look at on your label to see what you're getting. <clears throat> so first of all, so first of all, I need to work out how much of her ration will be coming from forage. So I work out what 1.6% of 70 is, so 70 being her body weight, um, and that works out at 1.12 kilograms of dry matter. So I know that it's a 10 and a half ME silage, so I just multiply that by 10 and a half, and from forage, she's going to get 11.8 megajoules of energy. So at seven weeks pre-lambing, a ewe only needs 11 megajoules. So at this point, there's no need for any supplementation. So long as she's making her intakes and she's um, she is eating 1.12 kilos of dry matter, then she doesn't need any supplement at that point. At five weeks pre-lambing, her requirements increase to 13 megajoules. So you can see at that point, there's going to be a slight shortfall and forage isn't going to be enough on its own. So the 1.2 there is the gap between 13 and 11.8. And that, in this case, is going to be filled by my concentrate or my compound, which is 12 and a half ME. So I divide the 1.2 by 12 and a half, which gives me my 0 0.096 kilograms of dry matter, um, which on a fresh weight basis, you just divide that by your 0 0.86 because it's 86% dry matter. It's going to be 0 0.11 kilos of compound. So it's not actually needing a lot to supplement at that point, only 0 0.1 kilos of compound at five weeks pre-lambing. When I get to one week pre-lambing, appetite of the forage slightly decreases, but her energy requirements goes up to 18 megajoules. So from forage, 1.4% of 70 being her body weight, she's going to be getting 0.8, sorry, 0.98 kilograms of dry matter. So again, multiply that by my 10 and a half, and that gives me 10.3 megajoules from the forage. So quite a significant energy gap between her requirements and what's coming from forage. So at that point, she's needing 7.7 .7 megajoules from the compound. So I work out 7.7 .7 divided by 12 and a half gives me 0.61 of a kilogram of dry matter. And I divide that by 0 0.86, which gives me 0 0.72 kilograms of compound feed. So at that sort of level, 0 0.72 kilograms, you're getting into quite a high level of compound feed. So I would split that over two feeds um, at one week pre-lambing if I was having to feed 0 0.72 kilos, ideally no more than half a kilo of compound feeds uh, in one feeding. Other things to check as well is how much does a bucket weigh? Uh, in this picture, I've got my bathroom scales and a luggage wear as just an example of how you can weigh a bucket. Um, it's such an easy thing to do. In, in this particular example, I've used 
10 kilos worth of feed in this bucket. And then you can work out if you know on a per head basis, okay, they need half a kilo per head. How much is a 10 kilogram bucket going to feed in your group and how many of these buckets are you going to need? So just simple basics like that on thinking about um, how you can be more accurate in, their, in your feeding um, and more efficient in how you're using your compounds. Uh, another thing I thought was worth mentioning as well is metabolic profiling um, is becoming more popular now and I think more people are using it as a rationing tool in tailoring their nutrition. So it's basically what is the you telling you about the ration. So ideally you want a blood test about three weeks pre-lambing. These metabolic Metabolic profile measures, um, first of all, the BOHB levels, and this gives you the short term energy balance. Uh, so, high levels would suggest that the U is a negative energy balance. Uh, so, they're, they're basically not getting enough energy from their ration and allows you time to adjust and, and work out where she may be falling short in energy. Lambs born to use with high BOHB levels have been found to have poor cholesterol transfer and there's work done by the University of Edinburgh very recently actually that showed that lambs were five times more likely um, to have, a, sorry, a ewe is five times more likely to have a lamb with insufficient antibody levels. Uh, so that is all down to colostrum. Uh, she may not be producing enough colostrum and then they're just not getting the antibodies that is needed uh, in those newborns. So really important to look at these energy levels and, and where you can rectify the problem if there is one. Uh, another measure they give you is the urea N and that's the effective rumen's gradable protein. That's a marker of her current protein in intake. So low protein can impact again your colostrum production and the immunity of the U herself. The third thing these metabolic profiles shows is the albumin levels. Uh, so that's the long-term protein balance. So low levels can indicate um, there's maybe been some liver damage because that's where the albumin is produced. So things like fluke or if there's been blood loss or potentially a long-term protein undernutrition issue. Again, the same study that showed those use with um, with um, high BOHBs that were like more likely to have lambs with insufficient antibody levels. They also find a link with low albumin and lamb mortality in the same study as well. So uh, again, just a useful tool to have these metabolic profiles in how you can tailor your ration and rectify any issues that may not be shown up on paper um, and what's actually happening. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention is a forage budget. Uh, there's a lot of people quite worried about how much forage they've still got left. Um, some people, as Hazel mentioned at the start, she hasn't seen you know, uh, the ground since Boxing Day. So there are people that have been supplementing earlier than they would normally. Um, so getting a handle on how much of your forage stocks you have left and if you are needing to buy in any more to keep you going if spring is later this year, which a lot of people are suspecting it will be. Um, a really handy tool that's just been launched by FAST is this forage budgeting app that's available on this link. So it allows you to do your forage budget on your phone and basically takes all the work out of it for you and making it easier and more accessible. Uh, things that you need whenever you're carrying out a forage budget. If you do have a pit of silage, you need to measure the pit. So get your tape measure out, doing the height, length and width. And imagine if you're already into the pit, you may not have the wedge to worry about, but taking it off the, the face and working it out that way. Uh, the next thing you need is to work out the volume in the pit. So once you have these measurements of height, um, length and width, you can work out the volume. So that's just basically multiplying up length, width and height together. So in my example, it comes to 1,440 meters cubed. The next thing is the density of the pit. So for this, you'll need the dry matter of the silage as well. So in my example, I've got my forage analyzed and it's come back at 35% dry matter. Uh, this is the density table. I've taken this from the farm management handbook, um, but 
if you are using the app on your phone, it will work out the density automatically once you've put in the height of your clamp and the dry matter percentage. So you can see in my example, the height of my clamp was three meters and it's 35% dry matter. So that's the density taken from that table at 630. So you work out in tons of fresh weight. So I have 907 tons of fresh weight left in my pit. And in a dry matter basis, that works out at 317 tons of dry matter. And same sort of principles if you have bales. Um, so in this example, I've used two different bale stacks. In the first stack, I've got 200 bales and averaging weights about 500 kilos. So if you can weigh a couple of bales, that is really useful because they can be so variable, especially depending on sort of the balers and machinery that's used that can have such an effect on how densely packed they are into those bales and the dry matter as well. Uh, so in this example, I've got 500 kilogram average bill weights. Uh, I've worked out what that is on a fresh weight basis, which is just multiplying 500 by 200 and then putting that into tons. In this first stack, it's 45% dry, dry matter. So in a dry matter basis on the first stack, I have 45 tons. Working it the same way through in the second stack, I have 59 tons of dry matter. And then just a guide uh, there on the bottom as well. Uh, obviously, if you can weigh some using maybe weigh scales, front end of the tractor loader, maybe a, a neighbor's mixer wagon or a weigh bridge, uh, those are better options. But as a guide, a five foot wide round bale is around 630 kilograms and a six by four rectangle bale is around 350 kilograms. So the next step is working out the total silage available. So that's your clamp and your bales. So I worked out my clamp had 317 tonnes. My bales have 104 tonnes, putting the two stacks together. So that's 424 tonnes of dry matter available. If I've done my rations as well, you can look at how much of dry matter they're going to require from your rations and then look at how much you've got available to, to see you through the, the winter into the spring and if you are needing some additional forage in that instance. Uh, I thought I would just briefly mention a feed outlook as well. Uh, so since October, a lot of people probably realise that feed prices have risen between sort of 20 to 40 pounds a tonne. That is mainly dependent on the protein and level of barley uh, in those feeds. The feed barley has remained relatively cheap at around a 50 to 60 point discount to wheat. However, in some areas it is proving harder to source. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. The price of soya is very high. It was quoted around 471 points a ton. So it is high. Um, other proteins have followed suit and there's growing interest in some of these protected cold pressed rapeseed as an alternative, uh, both from a sustainability point of view and from a financial point of view with the cost of soya as it is. So when I was talking at, in my first slide about that bypass protein that's needed in, in later pregnancy as she's um, coming close to lambing, supplementing with soya, although it does provide that bypass protein, it may not be um, uh, as economical, so looking at other alternatives such as these cold pressed rapeseed um, alternatives might be something you want to look at this year. Uh, maize gluten might be a good alternative at 20% crude protein to some dark grains, depending on the price. Um, dark grains were being imported, um, but I think production was starting again in February times, so there may be more local sources again. So making sure that you ask the price and spec before ordering any proteins and looking at maybe reviewing your rations as well to see where protein savings can be made given the current cost um, of feeds at the moment. I also wanted to mention some options for mineral supplements. Uh, I wasn't going to go into requirements, but if you do have any questions at the end about requirements, feel free to ask. Um, but I thought just on the options for what mineral supplements you can provide. Uh, there's blocks and licks. Obviously, they're more convenient. They do have a place. They're originally you know, designed for out on the hill grazing use, and they have become, they have gained popularity. Uh, you can get feed blocks with these high energy buckets that provide around two to three megajoules extra. 
um, and obviously they prevent bullying at the trough as well. The only thing with blocks and licks is obviously you're going to have to rely on the use to go and you know self-service and take their intake um, and they are quite expensive as well so just something to bear in mind that if you are lambing indoors and um, there was a lot of people that said they were outdoors lambing as well which they might have a place in that scenario the indoor lambing might want to look at some other alternatives that are available um, but yeah as I say blocks and licks do have um, a place and are more convenient uh, boluses, again, uh, put a picture on the side there of some boluses. They generally only cover the trace elements. Some also have vitamins as well. It'll just depend on the brand. They do tend to vary, but they don't cover things like your macro minerals. So your, like magnesium, calcium, uh, phosphorus, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's just something to bear in mind. Depending on the base of your ration, that might be okay. Uh, but it, in general, they only cover your trace elements. So that would be uh, your copper, cobalt, selenium, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, generally, copper um, will be only added if needed due to the toxicity risk that it poses in sheep. But they tend to be longer acting, they last for months uh, rather than weeks. And it's meant to be a slower release. So they're meant to get their intakes uh, slowly released each day and it's a good coverall method because you know everything has got uh, some form of minerals. Uh, drenches is the other option again a very broad range they usually contain trace elements and vitamins they will be cheaper than a bolus but they'll, they'll also be shorter acting so only last weeks compared to months in a bolus uh, so that's something to be aware of as well. Uh, mineral premix, so ensures every animal is getting minerals and vitamins through their mix, uh, what's in front of them in their ration. So it's a good option for indoor feeding. In the picture there on the right, you can see I've got my little Tupperware box. This is just Tupperware from the kitchen and I've um, scooped out some minerals from the bag and weighed them on my kitchen scales and there's a kilogram in that Tupperware box. So it's a really useful exercise just to work out like, you know, have a specified container that you maybe use specifically when you're feeding minerals. And you can work out if, example, for example, your user needing 25 grams per head, you'll know in this kilogram box how many that's going to feed. So that'll feed about, you know, 40 U's in a, a pen. And you can just sprinkle it over the top of the silage and you'll know that that way they're getting uh, their intakes from their minerals. And of course, there's mineralized U rules and blends. So always reading the label on recommended feeding levels, because if you're maybe feeding less of a concentrate, um, you might not meet the full requirements, uh, depending on how they have tailored the minerals in that U rule or blend. And the other really important thing with mineral supplementation is not to overdo it as well. Don't supplement where it's not needed. Don't start bolusing, drenching, and provided a mineralized you rule, because too much of a good thing can be as big a problem as a deficiency. So don't supplement where it's not needed. Having a look at things like the bloods and your forage analysis as well, and seeing where you might have deficiencies and where they're actually needing mineral supplementation is really important. So just to finish off, uh, things to think about. Obviously, twin lamb disease risk is a big problem, specifically usually in your overfat ewes. And if they're not getting their feeding due to snow cover, uh, twin lamb disease is basically down to her not being able to meet her energy requirements, hence why it tends to happen in um, ewes that have more than one lamb. So really important just to bear in mind that those that are on lower quality forages or maybe bulky low dry matter root crops, um, you may want to put them on higher quality feeding at that point, um, not introducing too much concentrates um, by any means, but just putting them on to higher quality feeds to try and meet those energy requirements. As they say, prevention is always better than cure. So trying to prevent uh, those twin lamb disease risks. Uh, being mindful of ewes that are away wintering as well, you know, checking in on them. Is there alternative feed being provided? Have you set up that with 
um, the farm that they're being away wintered at? And maybe is there uh, a time when it's better just to bring them home um, if they're being away wintered somewhere where there is a lot of snow cover? And maybe it's better just to, to bring them home. And also minimizing stress. Uh, and what I mean by the, the stress level is if you've decided to maybe bring them inside because of the snow cover, um, and it's better just to bring them inside. And they're going to be going on to a different ration, mixing groups potentially. It's not probably the best time to also be treating them you know, for, for veterinary vaccinations and things like that. So trying to minimize their stress. Uh, just to let them settle. Um, training hillies as well to eat hard to eat hard feed or feed blocks. Uh, it's not ideal when you know sheep haven't been introduced to feed. They don't know what they're doing, so it's quite difficult to train them at this time. But you know, if it's uh, if it's possible, you could possibly bring them into a small field, offer them a small quantity of a high quality feed, just to sort of get them onto it or you know, the feed blocks at 1 to, to 30 use to get them started. Uh, ensuring good feed space is, is sufficient. So the requirement is around 45 centimetres per ewe. If she's got, if she's slightly bigger, it'd be about 50 centimetres uh, per ewe uh, of, of trough space, um, that is for concentrates. So that's also really important. The ration can look perfect on paper, but if it's not being presented in such a way that every you can get access, you'll just get the bullies going in there, pushing, prolapsing, issues like that. So you want to make sure there's um, a calm, calmness in the shed and that the shire feeders aren't being pushed back and that they can also you know, get their requirements as well. Uh, so that is the end of my talk. Um, so I'll hand over for any questions now. Um, hopefully there's lots of questions. <laughs> Um, yep, there is many. <laughs> no, thanks very much. Um, that was a really quick whistle stops tour of uh, a lot of information um, to cover. And obviously, there's a lot of information we couldn't also cover in such a short space of time. Um, I think what I would say is if anybody you know, has any questions that we, we can't cover tonight, then please don't hesitate to get in touch or email the, the FAS email address um, and we'll, we'll try and get back to you. So we've got a few questions here, Mary. Um, the first one is we've got a, a farmer who plans to twin orphaned lambs or, or spear lambs onto a yow that's just had a, a single. Um, what protein would you advise is best to help that yow produce enough milk without making the lamb that she's got in her, you know, too big so that she might encounter lambing difficulties, but also preparing her to actually take that, that extra lamb afterwards? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, the lactation requirements for a single, they tend to produce less milk because she's only got a single. So it's usually about, I think it's a litre of milk in the first month that you ration for. Um, so pre-lambing, I probably wouldn't increase her protein more than I would uh, as a treater, as a you carrying a single. I think it's once she's lambed, that's when I would be tailoring her feeding to, to cope with having two lambs on her. Probably she'll go out to grass, I would assume as well, um, and, and she'll get most of her requirements from grass. But if she is, you know, body condition score is quite good, she'll have enough body reserves. But if she's not, then maybe, you know, giving her a bit of concentrate and treating her like a twin at that point. But I think pre lambing, I would probably treat her you know the same um and just treat her as a single at that point and not until she's lambed and is um got the second one on her that's when I would start changing her nutrition yeah being better too and this is, I think it's important to add as well that make sure that the lamb you know the orphaned lamb has had sufficient colostrum from elsewhere yeah. um as well make sure that it's had the the best chance before we turn it on perfect um we've got somebody else that's got two silages and they're wondering which one you would feed to to use pre-lambing so the first cut silage is they're actually both very good silages um 25 percent dry matter 10.8 me and 11.2 percent protein and the mm -hmm. second cut is 20% dry matter um, and commented is very wet, 11.3 me, which is excellent, and 11.5% crude protein. So if they were your silages, Mary, which one would you feed to your yows pre-lambing? 
Yeah, both very similar in quality. I think the biggest difference, as you said, is the dry matter. So I might be tempted to use the wetter stuff first, just because our intakes can drop slightly. It, it depends on the sort of overall fermentation of it as well. It tends to be with these wetter silages, they're more acidic um, because they've had to ferment more to to stabilize them in the pit or the bales, depending on how they've been stored, but they can affect their intakes. So before, when they're a bit further off, I would maybe use the wetter stuff and then the drier stuff as they're closer to lambing, because you don't want to be affecting her intakes. You want to make sure they're as high as possible. Um, so th yeah, that, that's maybe how I would choose to feed them, unless you could maybe use, some people use wet silages mixed with something like sugar beet pulp if they have a mixer wagon, just to try and sop up some of that extra liquid and help sort of balance um, if that was an option. But uh, yeah, very similar quality wise, obviously the energy and protein is fairly good in both of those. Um, that dry matter is probably the only thing that really swings it for me. Yeah, yeah. This is it, and I think they're quite fortunate with a good silage like that that they don't need to yeah. hopefully buy too much, too much deer concentrates at this time of year. Um, we've also got a couple of people, so we've got somebody, we've got opposite ends of the scale here, so we've got somebody with overfat yows concerned about twin lamb disease, but also struggling to manage their yows obviously in this snow. So at the moment they're getting hay, but they suspect there's not enough feed space for everything just with the amount of ring feeders they've got access to. So they're getting fed hay and access to mineral buckets do you think they're likely to be getting enough energy sort of eight weeks pre-lambing at the moment yeah eight weeks pre-lambing their energy requirements will still be around probably nine megajoules so from a good quality hay they'd probably get enough um it really does depend on the quality of the hay i've seen some shockers of hay as well that is you know only sort of six seven megajoules um so Probably I would analyze the hay just to see what the quality is like. Um, it only costs about you know 20 pounds to get it analyzed. So I forgot to mention that earlier. It's not a massive cost. Um, and the benefit of whether you prevent twin lamb disease or reduce your concentrate levels is, is huge. But yeah, I would say check what the hay is analyzing like. And if it is falling short, um, or if they're maybe not making their intakes, I think with ring feeders as well, maybe if you can roll it out on the snow, if that would be an option just to help with the access issues. Um, and yeah, if, if they do find the hay is not going to be sufficient, then adding a, a good quality compound at low levels. Um, at, at this stage, they shouldn't need you know more than 0 0.1, 0 0.2 kilos of compound at eight weeks pre-lambing. I would avoid trying to you know, over -com complicate yeah. things. Um, this is it. Yeah. It's also good to you know make sure they've got something so that they've got fibre in the room as well, isn't it? Like you said earlier. Yeah. And then somebody at the other end of the scale, who again is sort of six to eight weeks off lambing, but are concerned their yows are a little bit thin. Um, they're worried that putting too much concentrates into them at this stage to get the condition on them will make the lambs big and give them some problems at lambing time. Is there a sort of stage where it's dangerous to feed you know too much concentrates and just make those lambs a bit a bit bigger than they should be? Or do you think yeah. putting the condition on the yows may be more, more important at this stage? Yeah, I'd say probably getting the condition on the yows is probably more important, but you're not going to make massive changes to their condition at this point. Like at, at this point in pregnancy, it's not really the ideal time to be trying to put you know, a full condition score on that. That's a lot to be asking of her. Um, as I was saying with fit use, you know, losing about half a condition score is okay. I'd say similar with thin use, I wouldn't be aiming for more than half a condition score, but at eight weeks pre lambing you're probably not going to achieve that level of, of gain. So yeah, you can, at this point, you know, be good to her you could put her in with the twin news or if it's you know a whole flock situation where most of them are thin then you know treating them uh just just treating them with a bit of tlc and adding a bit extra but don't be um don't go too extreme and don't be given too much because then you can you can cause other issues like acidosis big lambs uh, as they were concerned about so at this point i would probably just be if, if they have better forage available or uh, if they don't, then, then complementing with some compound just to try and get the, the a little bit of condition or maintaining yeah, a, a high plane of nutrition. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And another option as well is um, putting molasses licks out um, if anybody can be, be bothered with the hassle and the mess. But um, yeah. that's another option as well, just to get some more energy into them. And another interesting question, um, is there any value in giving salt lick buckets to yows, to pregnant yows? It's often um, something people maybe think about afterwards, you know, for orphan sheds and things like that. But um, what about pre, mm. pre-lamming? Um, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. I, I know that in, you know, lambs and things, it's to ch- help increase their, their intakes. And um, I suppose at this point, w- I, I didn't really mention their water requirements, but water is really important. And a lot of people are out defrosting water troughs and ca- carrying out water and things. They do need about four to five litres of water. So if you're giving them salt licks on top, that might just increase their desire for for more water as well so uh, yeah I don't I don't know that it's a a standard practice and I haven't met many people that do put out salt licks um that that was just something that sprung to mind would be their their water intake might increase Mm. on that which could be a problem just now as well couldn't it when we all don't know about anybody else but defrosting pipes several times a day um Perfect. And I'm not going to go through, there's sort of a lot of individual people a bit concerned about their, their forage stock. Um, on those questions, I would, I would definitely reiterate what Mary said about the, the FAS app. So um, anyone that wants to have a look at it, it's available for Android and iPhones. So if you go onto the FAS website, it's one of the first things that pops up is the app. And I would definitely, it's free to download. I would definitely give it a try. It's really quick and easy to work out the forage you've got left. And I mean, only... Um, just the other week there, I had a, a client that was really concerned about the forage they had left, um, done a quick calculation, definitely don't have enough forage to, to see them to the spring. Um, so what they had to look at was, well, what, what group of stock do they want to focus on? And they decided to focus on their, their large flock of ewes. And store cattle are normally sold in April, but they decided to, right, we need to offload something, sold a big batch of the store cattle. And actually, with the price just now, got a roaring trade. We're delighted with it. And now that they can relax and focus on the fact that they've got these pregnant ewes to to look after. And I mean, whether you you feed hay, silage, um, you know, a TMR ration, roll, soya, whatever, I mean, I think Mary's really brought home the point that we, we need to look after these yows just now. We expect them to, to do a lot. We want a lot from them. Um, not only do we want them to, to make a good job of these lambs, we want them to get back in lamb, you know, a few months after. So um, we've got a big part to play as well in, in making these decisions to, to help them get it to right. Um, there's a couple of people asking if it's worthwhile buying silage in. Um, I don't know if Mary would agree, but I, I would definitely say yes, um, especially if it's an area that has got you know, snow or something like that just now. Um, we, we need to be looking after them and making sure we can balance their their demands and do the, the best thing for them. Do you agree, Mary? Yeah. yeah, I would say a lot of people have said they've got a lot of hay kicking about as well. So even if you're able to use your hay at the minute when our requirements are still, you know, fairly low and then keeping your better, you know, if you have silage that's better quality, keeping that closer up to lambing when our requirements kind of hike up but yeah definitely say if you find you are going to be short then buying in some sort of forage um is a good idea definitely. yeah yeah and again you know having a wee go at your your own forage budgets I mean obviously the, the rations Mary went through and um, they're, they're quite hard to digest sometimes just looking at a screen but I mean this recording will be available on the FAS website so feel free to go back and watch it you know pause that slide and just sit and work through it yourself and um, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of value in doing that um, and as I say any questions don't hesitate to get in contact with with us um, and we can look forward um, and try and give somebody a bit of a hand but unfortunately that's all the questions we've got time for I apologize to anyone we've not been able to answer but we will have a look through them and, and try and get back to everyone individually but I would just like to thank Mary for for giving us a, a really informal webinar tonight and I would like to thank everyone for for joining So thank you and good night, everyone.